All right, let's get back to it. When we take a look at this cross, one parent goes on the side, typically the male parent, the other parent on the top. When we put them in, we get a big P, little P, big P, little P, little P, little P, little P, little P. So our correct answer, good, is E, correct, yes. So E is our correct answer. We have no homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, two homozygous recessive. Good. All right. All right, and now do this one here. I know some of you are like this one, I got it, but we'll go through it anyway. So when you cross two individuals who are both little p for all of their alleles, can you get any big p's or dominant p's? So that should be, and just looking at this, I know a lot of you went, well, you can't get any dominant alleles out of two homozygous recessive parents. So your parent generation, which is little p, little p, you will also have your F1 generation, all little p, which gives you C as your correct answer. Some of the things that we talked about last lecture on meiosis, as a result of Mendel's studies that he did, he came up with these laws. And um, if you remember what a law is, a law, a principle, or a theory, these are pieces of information in the scientific community that lots and lots and lots and lots of scientists have done lots and lots and lots of experiments, and they've all come to the same conclusion. So it is as closely accepted as what we might call a fact as possible. But in science, we typically don't call things facts because there is always room that technology changes in the future and we disprove one of these quote unquote facts. So let's talk about some of his other laws. We looked at this again when we talked about mitosis and meiosis, what we know. And I showed you an illustration earlier that when you have a parent who has two alleles for a trait, that their gametes result in one allele each for that trait. You have to separate down your alleles to an N or haploid amount of information because you're going to get one chromosome from each parent. And the point of going through meiosis and getting a one N amount of information, amount of information in the gametes is so that you get the precise amount of DNA or chromosomes in your offspring. So that we have 46 chromosomes in every one of our cells in our body with the exception of sperm or egg, depending on your biological sex. And in those, you get one of each kind of chromosome to go back to giving you a whole amount. We don't want too much DNA. We don't want too little DNA. So let's answer this question. According to the law of segregation, in an organism with the genotype big A, little a, what's up with their gametes? Give these a read over. Which one's the correct answer? 
Good. Okay. C is correct. I'll do. I'll try and do this really quick. So if you have an individual who's big A, little A, before going into meiosis, the DNA has to replicate. Each of our alleles gets a genetically identical sister chromatid, which then goes into meiosis one. We can get some crossing over of pieces of these chromosomes. We can get some independent assortment. So let's say that we get a little independent assortment here. The little A's go this way, the big A's go that way. We go into meiosis two. And we end up with our haploid gametes. And if we put on the chromosome numbers that we start out with a 2N individual, DNA replicates, we get that 2N times 2. After meiosis 1, we get an N times 2, N times 2, and when each of these N times 2 separates, we get an N, 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 or haploid gametes. Anybody, any questions? All right, so Mendel also came up with a law of probability based on looking at his results. Our instinct is if we take a look at this cross of an individual or two individuals who are both heterozygous for both traits, two individuals heterozygous for this trait, big T, little t, heterozygous, So if we just take a look at that pun and square. T's are tough because sometimes we go up above on a big T. So again, make them exaggerated so you don't mess up your letters. So what we end up getting is we get one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, one homozygous recessive. Our phenotypic ratio We take our two dominant genotypes, translate them into tall, the dominant trait, one short, little t, little t. So what you might think, and one of the things that Mendel found out was that this ratio of three tall to one short, when we took each of these numbers and divided by the total amount of offspring, so let's say in this case, there was only four offspring, what we got were, was 75%. 75% tall, 25% short. Okay, well, what does that 25 and 75 mean? What they actually mean is that every offspring, every child has a 75% chance of being tall and a 25% chance of being short. It does not mean that you will have 
as a mating pair, 75% of your offspring will be tall and 25% short. Because what could happen is that, let's say they only have two offspring and each offspring has this ratio, ratio chance that both offspring could end up being dwarf, but the parents were tall. And sometimes we see weird things like that in a family. And, and again, genetics gets really, really complicated. But um, for example, my sister's husband, he was 6'2". Both of his parents were 5'1 and 5 foot. And everybody goes like, wait, what? How can that be? How can two really short people have a child who's a foot or more taller than them. And that's because again, a lot of combining of genes, but most of the genes that he got that they were had in their possibility of genes to contribute to his height, he got a lot of tall genes that they were not expressing. His uncles, his dad's brothers were both over six foot. So in that family, they had three boys, two really tall and one really short. And so that's just the way that these ratios go is that each child has this percentage chance of receiving these genes. So I just wanna point that out, kind of interesting. The more offspring you have, let's say that these individuals had a thousand offspring, it would likely be closer in total to this. Likely, but again, could be 50-50 that 50% of their offspring come out tall and 50 come out, 50 percent come out short. Because every individual has that probability or possibility of receiving the genes. All right, let's do another cross. These little examples are great ways to just make sure that you are on track and ask questions if you need. All right, if the allele for inflated P pods is big I, the other thing that I like to do, because you will get questions just like this. This is the way questions on the exam will be presented. So that I like to make a chart. Right away, it tells me the allele for inflated P pods, capital I, is dominant. So I'm going to make the capital letter. And I'm going to write equals inflated. And then it's dominant to allele for constricted, so little i. This is a great thing to do because when you have tests, all of us get test anxiety. We get nervous. 